All right, welcome to the next section here about uh, sculpting characters and hopefully a little bit of design information when you're designing characters. And I'm just going to give a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about here. So I'm going to be doing all of this in 3D code. Um, and then once we have something we're happy with, we're going to export it and then import it into uh, Mixamo, which is kind of just a browser uh, program and it's an Adobe product. Um, and what it does is actually uh, auto rig your uh, skeleton. So it'll, it'll add in kind of bones to your character and allow you to pose them uh, with preset animations. Um, and it's a really useful tool. Also, if you just want to grab some quick uh, basic characters that are sort of presets as well. So we'll talk about all that shortly. Um, but for now, let's start with 3D code and uh, let's talk about the process that I've sort of uh, figured out works well for some quick characters. So a word on that, um, I'm not actually, you know, a character designer per se, that's not my specialty. And um, in terms of character sculpting, I've seen really amazing results uh, people get out of ZBrush in particular, as opposed to 3D code. Um, and that's because I think ZBrush's strength is really in highly detailed um, sculptures and really, really, you know, realistic stuff. Um, and 3D Coat's strength, again, is just, I think, in my opinion, more about for concept art, it's a lot faster and a lot, um, you know, sort of more intuitive to use. So for the kind of work that I do where I just want uh, a character that isn't necessarily going to hold up right up close to camera, but I just want something very, very quick um, to use in the midground and background that I can say that I've actually designed. So that's what this process is gonna sort of cover. And um, it's just the, the method that I found works well for me. So let's get started. So first things first, I'm gonna click on this voxel sculpting option. And um, if, you, if you aren't familiar with 3D code, I would suggest go, going back and watching the uh, section that I already recorded on just the basics of 3D code and UI and all of that. Um, so for now, we get these uh, character options here. And um, you can actually import your own base mesh um, to start with, or you could even sculpt your own, but I wouldn't recommend that unless you're really you know, an expert on anatomy and, and you're already very comfortable with sculpting. Um, so for now, let's just click on this more realistic option right here. And that's kind of a base male character to start with. And let's turn on the grid and let's turn on orthographic view as well. Real quick, if you did want to start with a different type of base mesh, you know, a female character, for example, or something with more or less muscles, um, you could just download that from a lot of different areas on the internet for, for free. And all you would have to do instead is just click on File, Import, and uh, choose Import Mesh for Voxelization. And uh, you'd be able to start sculpting on top of that instead of this default character. But let's just use that for now. So, um, the first thing we're going to do here is turn on symmetry. So I'll do that on the x-axis. And the next thing is we're going to smooth out a few of these really hard edged um, features here. Um, so I'm going to go over to the smooth tool. And basically, the reason for doing this is we're going to be extruding out some clothing and um, you know costuming from this base. Uh, figure and we don't want it to pick up all these really small little details here. We only want the basic forms to uh, end up influencing the clothing. So I'm not going to overdo it. We still want it to be, you know, realistic anatomy, but just in the areas where we're going to be adding on clothing, it makes sense to sort of smooth that out a little bit. All right. So, um, you know, in the back of my mind, I want to do some kind of medieval knight or palace guard type character. So on my other monitor, I just kind of had some very basic knight armor reference to uh, get, get started in a good direction. Uh, but before we start designing all that kind of cool fancy armor, we just need to add on some basic clothes. So um, let's, let's talk about how to do that. So um, it, we're going to be using a tool we haven't talked about before. And if you scroll down here, um, it's all the way down here. It's called box layer. Um, box extrude could work in some situations, but it's a little bit too strong or kind of thick for clothing. So box layer will work well for us in this case. And another another aspect of 3D coat that we're going to be using that we haven't talked about 
is um, we're going to be trans or sort of uh, transferring this whole mesh into surface mode rather than voxel mode. So we talked about it a little bit before, but basically surface mode is more similar to other types of programs where um, you just have polygons in an outer shell of the sculpture instead of all throughout the, the middle of it. And in terms of 3D coat, it's a, it'll be a little bit faster. Um, we won't be able to do the exact types, same types of sculpts with it, but in, in this case, it makes sense because you do get a little bit more fine detail with it. Um, and we'll talk about all the, the applications of that in a minute. But for now, all we need to do to uh, switch this over to surface mode is just click on this layer, this V. If you just click that, it should switch over to this S. And that means we're on surface mode now. Um, so that's kind of the first step here. And the tools themselves will actually change in this case um, because the surface tools are slightly different than the Vox tools. Um, but some of them are the same, and the one we're interested in is still there, Vox layer. So that one works in both both voxel mode and surface mode. So let's select that. And I've set the hotkey to that, by the way, to shift V for uh, Vox layer. And all we wanted to start out with is um, make a selection on this mesh for some type of a shirt. So there's a lot of ways to do that. We could paint it on with a brush, or we could make a selection with one of these options. So let's just uh, choose this um, lasso tool for now, just because that's easy. And we'll make a little selection of where we think a shirt could go. No one needs to do it on you know, the first half, and it'll cross over. And oh, so, so um, one note there, see it, it only made a selection in the front. So let's Control-Z that. And uh, all that means is, we actually want to hit the E key again and turn off ignore back faces. And now it'll select through the entire mesh. So let's do that again. Select out a shirt and you see it's uh, made a selection all the way through the mesh. And um, before we hit apply and create a new layer out of that, we need to talk about a few of the settings in this uh, box layer option. So, um, uh, so first of all, instead of auto voxelize, we don't want to make a voxel mesh. So let's click that drop down and switch over to create as a surface. Okay. Um, secondly, we want to start thinking about layer offset thickness of the new layer. Um, a couple notes on that. So you want something that's very, very thin for clothing, obviously. But you don't want to make it too thin because you will want the option to switch the new layer back over to voxels later. And if um, voxels don't work too well with an object that's very, very thin, uh, when we switch over to voxels, it'll, it'll kind of have holes in it and, and it won't work well. But there, are, there is a way around that. So one thing you can do is turn this layer offset to a negative value. So let's do like negative two, for example. And what that means is the offset from this uh, outer edge of the sculpture, um, the, the new layer will actually be pushed in a little bit to that uh, sculpture. So the part that will, will be visible will only push out a little bit from the, the body, but it'll look thin um, in practice. So I'll show you what I mean. So let's change the thickness to a little bit more than that negative value. Let's say like 2.5 or something like that. And let's see what happens when we finally click apply here. Might take a second to calculate based on how high res the mesh is. And now we have a little bit of a shirt. So um, just to illustrate what I was trying to explain there. So this is the thickness of the shirt that is um, you know, separate from the body. But if we actually hide the body, we'll see the shirt is actually much thicker than that. And possibly too thick, in fact. We might want to adjust that. Um, but that it, that offset inside inside the body, so it's not visible. But it's useful to have that mesh information for when we want to switch over to voxels later. So actually, let's let's um, try that again. Let's make it a little bit less thick. So we'll control control Z that um, you know up application, and we still have the selection here. Let's just adjust the thickness uh, and the offset a little bit. So let's make layer offset negative one. And let's try the, the thickness to be 1.5. Um, and we'll hit apply and see if that's a slightly better solution. So 
in practice, it should look the same because it's still 0.5 um, past the body offset. But if we hide this, yeah, the thickness of the uh, shirt itself is a little bit less crazy now. So let's stick with that. Okay, so hopefully that makes some sense. And we'll, we'll talk about how we switch over to voxels, why that step was so important. So now let's, um, let's change the uh, shirt over to a little different material there so we can see what's going on. Let's add some pants in here. So I'll select the original mesh. And you can see the selection is still there. So we actually need to clear selection. And now we can go ahead and make a new one. Um, let's use this uh, straight tool just so that we can get something quickly. And uh, one, one thing we have to keep in mind with the pants now is we don't want it to overlap exactly with the shirt. Ideally, we'd have the pants be a little bit thinner so that the shirt kind of hangs over it. So all we need to do is change, uh, we could change the offset or the thickness, I guess, but let's change the thickness to be like one point uh, two or something like that. And let's hit apply. And now we have a new pants layer and you'll see because we made it a little bit thinner than the shirt, it looks like there's a shirt uh, overlapping pants there, which is exactly what we want. So let's uh, change the shader. So that's a bit more obvious what's going on. And you see, if we hide this shirt, it is hanging over the pants at the hem there just a little bit. So this is a good place to start. Let's add in some boots really quickly. So we can actually hide all the other layers by holding Alt and clicking the eye. And you can just get them back by doing it again, holding Alt and clicking the eye. So I'll just do that to isolate the base mesh and we'll clear the selection once again. And uh, we'll select some uh, area that would make sense for boots here. In this case, we want it to be nice and thick for some, you know, some kind of guards boots or, or and it should go over the pants as well so we will actually want the thickness to be even thicker so maybe 1.7 you can see how that looks hit apply and if we show everything else we'll see yeah we made the boots a little bit thicker than the pants so that's kind of the design that we wanted so let's let's give those boots um a new shader again just so that we can kind of see what's going on here this is not that the colors will end up with, I'm sure, but uh, just a quick base. All right, so that's kind of the process here. Um, we're, we um, made everything really thick so that we could switch back over to voxels. And I wanna show you one application, one reason why we might wanna do that. So if I go ahead and select the pants, and if I click this S, we should get this option um, before it switches back over to voxel mode it's telling us that to keep this uh, exact form, it would need this resolution of voxels. So 1,800,000 is quite a lot, but let's just hit okay for now. And it might take a second to calculate that. And you'll see this switched over to a V here. So that means the pants are now back into voxel mode. And uh, now we should have all the tools that we are used to over here that work with voxels. So there's a couple things you can do here. Um, you could split or voxide to kind of get some interesting seams here. So let's try that. So, whoops, that's the wrong hotkey. Let's try uh, voxide for a second. So we're, we're familiar with this tool. It should just um, hide a piece of it. Let's hold Alt and uh, click this um, pants layer to hide everything else. And let's just see if we can uh, make a selection here along the hem of these pants. And this doesn't have to be perfect, but I just wanna get the general sense. And that'll hide half of it, just like we're used to, and we'll show the other half. And it should create a nice little beveled seam in here. So now let's switch that back over to red. Yeah, and we should have some extra detail there. Uh, next, let's do exactly the same thing to the shirt object. So that's this one right here. Um, let's uh, try switching that over to voxels as well. We'll get a suggestion for density and resolution. We'll click OK for now. And we should be able to use all our regular tools on it. So um, let's Alt click to hide everything else. And again, it's thicker than it should be, but that thickness is going into the body, so it shouldn't be visible. And um, 
let's uh, let's try adding in uh, some type of seam here. There's a bit more complexity going on with the shirt though, so we should be aware of that. So let's select this uh, lasso tool, I think. And generally speaking with shirts, the arms have kind of a cut to them. Oh, so we're on the carve tool right now. That's the wrong one. Let's switch over to the box hide tool. And that should be a quick way of adding in some seams here. So if we show that mesh, it's kind of uh, the cut that I wanted. And then I think from a top view, I'm actually kind of looking at my own shirt for reference right now. There's, there's a little bit, if we select this option, we need to hide hidden geometry so we don't get it doubled. And then uh, we'll make a new seam right about there as well and show that. So that's, that's you know, just the very, very basic kind of shape that we're looking for. I guess we could uh, potentially add more detail if we needed to by selecting this original object again. And don't forget to delete hidden geometry. I've set that to control two, but if you're not sure where it is, it's geometry delete hidden. And, um, you know, we could potentially go back to Voxide, select an oval type shape and see if we can make an extra kind of line of detail in the front. And uh, let's try that again. Yeah, just something like that. And let's do the same or a similar process to the back. And show that. So that's the general process that we need. I guess we could add some cuffs with the same process. Um, let's do that really quickly. <clears throat> so we'll select, you know, the, the new layer there and just box hide kind of a small piece here. I think that would make some sense. And it might just look like some nice extra detail. And then uh, I think the I think this sleeve would all be one piece, but we could we could add a seam down here as well. But let's stick with that for now. And um, let's put all the shirts uh, layers that we just you know created here into one group. So I've set that to Shift H once again, and I'll just make sure everything is parented to each other. Oh no, you know what? We actually have to parent everything to this original layer. So shift H, click on it, shift H, click on it, and shift H, click on it. So now, yeah, everything except for that piece apparently. So that should be right there. So let's shift H and parent that as well to the green layer. Okay, so now all the shirt, let's rename that layer. Everything's in one nice group. And in fact, let's select all here and change, see if we can change each one over to the green just so that uh, we don't get confused about the design here. You actually have to do this one by one. All right, looking pretty good. Another trick you can use to um, add in one more level of detail is by um, painting in some stitching somewhere where you think seams would go. And uh, the best way I've found for that is the stitches tool. Um, and it only works with surface objects. Um, so I'll show you how to do that really quick. So let's uh, choose an object that is currently on surface mode with the boots. And we're selected on stitches. And this works in combination with strips and brushes. So we haven't talked too much about strips yet. But basically, they're another alpha um, that uh, painting uh, in combination with one of these brushes can give you some interesting effects. So um, you can just select the regular hard brush for now and then hover over here for the uh, strips menu. And there's a few default strips in here that do look kind of like stitching. Um, and I'll show you, you know, if you just select, let's say, the zipper one, this wouldn't make sense for this era that we're going for here, but uh, let's just see what it does. So first of all, we're on stitches and we want to up the steady stroke in this case. Um, if you uh, aren't sure what that does, it's just like in Photoshop where it'll, it'll allow your um, 
painting stroke to be a little bit steadier and smoother. So let's see what happens if we have that up high and we start making a selection here and it'll lag a little bit because there's a lot going on with this tool. Uh, but basically what that'll do, if you zoom in here, it's actually using that uh, zipper alpha to get a really nice and pretty high resolution um, extrusion and uh, it's cutting into the shape as well. So um, that works again only with uh, surface mode and um, that's probably the level of detail you'd like. All right, and I've sped up the video here and I'll just be starting on our actual palace guard character kind of from scratch. And I'll just be using kind of the exact same techniques that we just went over to block out some simple clothing and armor. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about design for a second. Um, on my other monitor, I kind of had just a little bit of very simple knight and armor reference. Um, you know, generally speaking, I find just keeping character designs really simple, especially if kind of the focal point of our painting, which is all about the environment, is meant to be, um, you know, the, the palace and the architecture. Uh, I think kind of like drawing the attention away with a really complex and, and kind of out there character design would sort of be a mistake. So I'm just gonna try and keep the character design here pretty simple. Um, we'll, we'll just be doing a little bit of armor here and uh, we'll add in a few little flowing shapes to kind of match the design language of the architecture, but not go too crazy with it. All right, so a couple notes uh, from the technical side here. You'll see right there, I forgot to turn on ignore back faces on uh, the box layer tool. And I had to kind of hide the selection there. Uh, to add on these armor pieces, I'm just, I'm just doing the exact same process. I'm, I'm just making a selection on the body, but making sure that the thickness uh, of this layer is much higher than the clothing. So that way it's going to, you know, when I turn on all the layers again, It'll extrude past the clothing uh, quite a ways, and it'll it'll you know it'll show up as a really thick armor layer. Uh, another important thing to mention here is that every time I'm adding in a new layer, especially with these armor pieces, uh, I'll try and do a smooth all, and um, I have set the hotkey to, uh, for that to shift uh, S. Um, and smooth all works a little bit better with surface mode than it does with voxel mode. With voxels, you sometimes get uh, some weird kind of banding effects. So I would, every time you add in a new layer, just do a little bit of a smooth. So I'm kind of starting over here with the armor a little bit. I wasn't that happy with sort of the design. I was looking a bit more closely at my reference and uh, I thought just kind of making the uh, sort of breastplate and back armor all one piece and then we can cut into it later. Uh, when we switch over to voxels. And I am occasionally switching over back to voxels and you know back to surface mode as needed. Mainly it's um, for the cutoff tool or the box hide tool is when I'll switch over to voxels. Um, there is, cutoff does work with surface mode, but uh, I find that with vox, voxel mode, it works just a little bit better and a little bit cleaner, kind of how you would expect. All right, so I'm kind of happy with the basic block out now, and I'll just be using a bit of the pose tool to sort of add in some little trim and details here. Um, you know, the uh, breastplate tends to have a little bit of a point towards the front. I think that's sort of to deflect, you know, arrows or, or weapons or stuff like that off to the side. And uh, just a little bit of a simple pose tool on the uh, symmetry will work well for that. And then additionally, just posing these little trim edges on the side here. I just find this method so much faster than trying to you know, use the build tool or, or some other sculpting tool and actually add those in here. The pose tool is just so incredibly versatile and uh, it can really be used in a lot of different ways here. Uh, one more thing, I did just adjust the um, profile of the pose tool to be a little bit sharper and that ended up working a little bit better um, just making these really hard kind of pose, uh, edges to these uh, pose movements. So now we'll work on this uh, sort of plated kind of uh, thigh armor here. Uh, I'll end up switching that over to voxels and just be doing that with uh, the vox hide. Um, I just find the vox hide, it's, it's one of the, you know, the tools that I'm the most comfortable with. And uh, I just find the way, the easy way it makes uh, bevels to cuts just to work really well. 
So we'll kind of try and hint at uh, sort of a little bit of range of movement with this armor. Um, you know, I had some reference that sort of had plates like this kind of bolted together so that they could um, potentially, you know, have some movement to them. Um, we'll add in some kind of little bolts in a minute, but uh, for now, let's just block that in. So on these uh, on these knee armor pieces, nothing too crazy going on here either. Just the pose tool, and then of course box side again to split them apart. And uh, I'll struggle a little bit with these um, kind of uh, shin armor pieces. I I couldn't get the selection that I wanted with the pose tool, and I'll try a different method here with this. Um, type of, uh, you know, pen tool selection that didn't work too well. And I'll, I'll end up just kind of manually going in there and using the, uh, the selection tools sort of brute force that I want just to get, a, again, a little bit of a uh, edge. That's all I wanted and nothing too fancy. And, you know, I think I did mention this while I was uh, sculpting the palace architecture. But I'll just reiterate it here. I find that in, when you're learning a new program and uh, you know there's a lot of new tools to learn with 3D code, I find just keeping it simple and really getting used to just you know a few tools that are um, kind of your strengths and your tool set and you don't get too you know caught up in all these other fancy uh, tools just yet. You can explore those later, but uh, at least for uh, you know keeping your professional work consistent, that's kind of the way to go. All right, so uh, we'll try moving on to this helmet here. And uh, I'm going to try some slightly sort of odd design with this. Uh, I, I kind of thought that even though we're only going to see the back of the head in, um, in our final painting, sort of experimenting with a few different designs from the front could be fun. And, um, you know, the, the, the function of the armor, the rest of the armor sort of um, has to serve a purpose. So it's sort of, in my mind, made sense not to get too fancy with it. Uh, but I find, I just kind of thought the helmet would be a good place to sort of experiment with some a um, little bit more uh, fancy or out there design. And um, hopefully that could help a little bit with some more storytelling and bring things uh, in, our, in our world a little bit more together. So I'll just be using the box hide tool here to cut out a few different cuts and um, nothing, nothing too crazy. I did just accidentally double up there because I forgot to uh, hide the hidden geometry on uh, the old layer. So again, I would caution you to always watch out for that. That constantly kind of comes up with the box hide tool. So I'll just be using this, uh, these sort of cuts here to try and hint at a little bit of that flowing shape language that we have in our architecture. And I'll be checking it with the uh, rendered view real quick, just because I wasn't completely sure about the design. And it helps a lot to just double check on how that's looking with the lighting. And now we'll try and add in a little bit more flowing shapes to sort of the interior detail of the, uh, the rest of the armor. Um, I know I said I was going to try to keep it really simple, but now that we added some uh, extra design elements to the helmet, I just felt like to keep things consistent, it would make some sense to try and add in a little bit more flair to this uh, breastplate and backplate armor. Um, and then also, you know, we're not going to ch experiment changing the silhouette of it too much. So, you know, if we really wanted to push the design, that's the direction we would go. Uh, but I've, I just kind of thought that a little bit of this sort of interior detail here as kind of a second read, um, it wouldn't push things too far out of the realm of, you know, realism and just kind of hint that uh, we're, we're within our, our design language that we've established for this world. So all I'll be doing is just a little bit of box hide to kind of add in a little uh, extra trim to these edges and uh, we'll move on. And then along those lines, another thing to kind of keep in mind here is that uh, the process we're going to be using to add in a uh, skeleton so that we can pose this character uh, using Mixamo, uh, that route doesn't allow for a really high level of detail. Uh, and that's primarily because we're going to, when we're done with this character, we're going to have to export for, uh, kind of the whole scene here. So all the different objects in one single you know, OBJ file. Um, so that, that 
file can't be too big. It can't be too heavy or else Samba won't kind of accept it. So, um, you know, keep that in mind if you're going to be detailing out a lot of little intricate, you know, extra details on a character like this, um, you know, the, the route we're going to go might not work for that, but that's, that's fine. You can still add that in and then just decimate that down as far as you need to in order for this process to work. Uh, and then you can kind of strike a balance between, you know, the level of detail that you really wanted and then kind of the level of decimation that this process kind of requires. And just moving on to adding in the last little bits of trim on the rest of the armor, just so that the kind of flared edge style does sort of carry over. And I'm considering adding in one more sort of curving shape, a uh, little detail on that uh, sort of bracer piece. So now I'll move on to a little bit extra detail on the clothing itself underneath the armor. Um, I just box hid the you know, the pants in half, just add to sort of a seam on the side. And then I'll experiment a little bit with a few different methods for adding in some stitching. Uh, we talked about using the, the stitches tool in uh, surface mode, and that method is fine, but it is a little bit heavy and, and detail oriented. So I'm just trying a few methods um, using primarily just, you know, the carve tool here and a, a sort of brush that mimics stitching. And I'm not looking for any kind of real, you know, intricate detail, just something that sort of hints. There's a little bit of a bug there, and uh, that's those floating sort of um, voxels just to the sides of the knees there. And uh, that, that's just sort of a bug that sometimes you encounter in 3D coat. And uh, I, just, yeah, I tried to cut them off there, but they actually just won't go away until you start moving on to some other meshes and eventually they sort of disappear. So don't worry, those sort of floating elements aren't part of your actual mesh. All right, and I'll try adding in some kind of a belt here. Uh, rather than extruding that from the armor because we've already sort of cut that into pieces with the Vox hide tool, we'll go back to the base uh, you know, body mesh and just extrude it out with a extra thickness so that sort of pops through the armor there. Um, you know, most of what I'm adding, um, I am going back to that original body layer and extruding from there. Uh, it'll just keep things sort of grounded and, and simpler than extruding out from clothing that we've already created. So I'll add in a few straps doing the exact same thing here. And, um, you know, not, not trying to get into too much detail with buckles and all that, just a, a simple sort of strap mesh will work. And I'll try uh, adjusting the shader color here just to get something a little bit closer to, you know, a, a brown leather. Um, you know, we're, it doesn't really matter for the design because we'll be doing all our texturing in Blender anyways. Um, and, you know, we're not going to be exporting the textures from here to, uh, to Blender at all. But, you know, just for the design sense, I find it really helps to sort of get at least some sort of sense of the, the base color that you know, you're gonna be going for at this stage. And we'll just continue adding in some more of those flared edge details to a couple elements that haven't gotten them yet. Uh, just the pose tool and uh, that, that's pretty much it to sort of extrude outward. All right, and we're basically happy with the general direction of the armor. So we're going to try in add in a, uh, another design element here, just kind of as a final sort of uh, cherry on top. And that's this extra sort of shoulder piece. And uh, there's a lot of reference out there for this type of thing. In fact, I think it's primarily, I could be wrong, but I think it's primarily mostly for jousting. This kind of a, a design element. So, you know, if the lance sort of slips off to the side from your shield, I believe it's supposed to hit this piece. Uh, so it doesn't quite make sense for something like this, but hopefully, uh, you know, that nobody's going to pay too much attention to those exact details. And I just think it looks cool as sort of a nice big kind of chunky design element here on the shoulder. And it'll sort of break up the symmetry as well. You know, most of this, actually all of this uh, character so far is completely symmetrical uh, until now. And um, you see you see a shoulder piece like this in a lot of different um types of media as well. And it's sort of, I think, become uh, kind of a uh, extra fantasy element that's, that's quite common. So we'll just go with it. 
and we'll add in a few bolts there. Uh, you know, real simple. We're not going to add in a new primitive or anything like that. We'll just sort of build outward from uh, the mesh that we've already created. And I'm struggling right now to get uh, this edge here next to the neck. Um, very. I'm trying to make it clean and you know a nice cylindrical shape. But uh, the problem is we extruded out from the body and the collarbone kind of has a wiggle to it. So this this piece isn't isn't going to work doing our, our regular method here from uh, with box layer. So I will actually have to go back in and create an entirely new object. I think it's the first time I'm doing this on this character. And uh, we'll just shape it into a cylinder and just use the move tool to kind of give it a little bit of a bend. Uh, very simple tools used here, right? It's just the move uh, on that. Uh, the move tool is, is sort of like, in my mind in, in 3D code, it's sort of the catch-all tool for any time you want to just quickly sculpt something but not worry too much about what tool you're using. It's just very handy for that. All right, so we'll just kind of slide it into place here and I'll, I'll try doubling it up just for uh, some kind of extra interest, interest to it. And uh, it kind of reminded me of some of the design language we're using in the palace where we ended up sort of layering two things together. And uh, in the back of my mind, that's kind of the justification for that. All right, and I'll add in another new element here that's just this uh, sort of circular um, kind of pivot point. I apologize, I don't know the you know technical term for this armor piece, but I think it's meant to sort of add a kind of a hinge to this piece so that it can it can move and you can lift your arm. Um, obviously, we're not getting too technical with the um, you know the exact placement of it. We're just going to sort of slap it on there, and uh, hopefully, it'll it'll work from a distance. Obviously, in our final painting, we end up only seeing the back of this character anyways, so it doesn't, doesn't end up mattering too much. But uh, we'll give it a shot just to kind of you know, build our world to the best of our ability and, and kind of have everything working from all angles. We'll try and uh, add in a tiny bit of a uh, design element here with that uh, kind of curve shape to it. And we struggled a little bit to, we tried adding a radial symmetry uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't get it to work in this because um, we had already rotated this element too much and on a bunch of different axes. So the radial symmetry was, was not really working the way we wanted to. Next, I'll attempt a little bit of a neck armor here. I wasn't going to because I, I kind of wanted more range of movement in the neck uh, in case you wanted to you know, turn the head a lot with our poses but it ended up, ended up just sort of feeling like it needed some extra element there. And we'll start adding in some of these little studs, kind of hinting at uh, bolts holding this armor in place. Uh, mostly I'm just using the base clay tool for that, um, you know, on just a, a real standard brush. And um, it's it, to me, one of the most simple little uh, sculpting tools. And, and that is, an, I believe, a new tool in the latest 3D coat. And uh, it's quite handy and simple. All right, so um, I know I said I wasn't going to add in buckles or anything, but I, I will try just on this main uh, sort of belt element, just so that we kind of have, you know, right here in the front of the design, um, something that is a bit more believable. And for this, um, I will be using the box layer tool on the belt asset that we already created, uh, rather than going all the way back to the body mesh and trying to extrude from there, we sort of made too many changes and moved it around too much. Um, so that, that'll that work completely fine just for these little uh, metallic elements that sort of extrude outward from it. All right, and we're actually coming up sort of to the end of uh, designing our character and we're almost ready to export to Mixamo for posing. Um, I just wanted to mention one little uh, point about cleanup here. So when I zoom way in, you can actually see some kind of jagged and crunchy edges on a lot of these elements. And that's quite common sort of uh, trick to 3D coat to sort of get around. Uh, and I just wanted you to be aware of a few options that you have. So those jagged edges are, made, are there because I, um, I made those Vox cuts um, in voxel mode when we were on pretty low resolution uh, comparatively, right? So in 3D code, you know, anything below, you know, 800,000 or even a million voxels is kind of low resolution for 3D code. Um, so if you, uh, you know, I wasn't, wasn't trying to get anything too detailed because this only needs to hold up from far away. 
But if you did want to get rid of those jagged edges, um, a few things you can try is first of all, just upping the resolution of each mesh that sometimes, you know, will get rid of most of it, uh, but not always. So you can also try smoothing all on your geometry. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that sometimes can affect it, especially if you switch over to surface mode first and then smooth all that often helps. And then the last thing is that um, sometimes when you right click your object in the sculpt tree and then choose transform to global space or sometimes uh, to uniform, uh, sometimes that that's all you need to sort of fix the uh, jagged edges issue. And um, sometimes though that that can make your mesh really, really high res. So often you'll need to um, you know, watch out for that if, you, if that's you know, not something that you want to be an element that's going to be really high resolution. All right, so we've finished up a character, at least it's you know, done enough for our purposes, again, just for kind of the mid ground and background areas. Um, so we're ready to try exporting this and import into Mixamo for uh, rigging and animation. So I'll walk you through that now. So for this, I'm actually going to just do file um, and then export. And in this case, we're going to do export scene so that we do get everything in the scene. Let's title this palace guard uh, one. OBJ is fine and we'll hit save. Now that'll start calculating um, and it might take a second because there's so many objects and there are a lot of high res objects. And we're going to have to choose a decimate uh, setting. And this is going to be where it gets really tricky. So right now, uh, by default, it's going to 50%, but that's leaving us with over 12 million, almost 13 million polygons. And that's going to be too big for Mixamo and probably Blender later as anyways. So let's see what happens. We can go reduce this way more. Um, ideally, we could get it down to under a million. Uh, I think we can sort of um, just stick stick with 96%, uh, just around a million, and we should be OK. Um, if we have really, really fine detail, we'd have to mess with that and see what the uh, maximum amount of detail that uh, Mixamo would accept. But for now, let's do that. I think with this level of detail, we should be completely fine. So we'll hit OK. And that'll take a second to calculate. It's a lot of decimation going on. And I'll skip to the end. All right. And it looks like it finally did complete there. So let's click over to the folder where we just exported it. Here's all my uh, files for this scene. And it looks like, yeah, we have the OBJ right there. So now that we have that, the next step is to go into Mixamo. And this is what it looks like when you're logged in. Again, all you need is just an Adobe account to log in, and it should be free. So um, real quick overview of Mixamo. Basically, there's, it's very simple. There's two tabs up here. There's characters and animations. So under characters, you'll find some default characters that Mixamo uh, comes with. And uh, if you wanted to, you could select one of these. This is just one of them. And uh, then you'd click over to animations. And there's a huge library of animations in here that you could scroll through and, and perhaps you know find something that might work for you. So you know just as an example, if we wanted this this option, uh, we'd see the default character would start doing that, and you'd be able to download and import it into Blender with all the textures and everything. But for us, we actually want to use our character. So this is where Mixelmo really shines. So um, if you were to click on this upload character option. You should get this menu, and now you should build to. So it's telling you, by the way, that you have these three file options for import, and we did an OBJ, so we should be good. We'll select character file and go grab the um, OBJ that we just exported. Click open, and it was pretty heavy, so this might take a minute to upload. Um, and if you know, if we had decimated it less, it would take even longer. So just keep that in mind with this process. And I'll skip to the end here. It doesn't look like it's taken too long. And here at the end, it might say uh, this sort of message processing character just a moment. That's completely fine. If uh, your character isn't too heavy or there isn't um, any floating objects in there that aren't connected to the main character, this should sort itself out in just a few minutes.
So I'll skip to the end and let you know how long this took. All right, and it looks like it finished processing there and it only took about two or three minutes. So that wasn't too bad. And we are now getting a, a nice preview of our character here. So um, this is just a quick quick overview of, uh, of our character. So we're you know, happy to see it wasn't decimated too far. Everything's looking about right. So I'll click on this next button. And here's where you have to tell the uh, Examo where um, the joints are for your character. So all you have to do is just drag these colored circles over to the corresponding part of the body. So I want to place this right on the chin of the character. And the, uh, the wrists would be we'll pin here. This is a really important step, though, so you want to make sure you're getting it just right. Knees just in the middle, maybe a little lower. And then groin right there and should be good. Uh, yeah, we definitely want to leave all these options the way they are. And now we'll click Next. And then that will take uh, another couple minutes as well for it to auto uh, rig, which is again is just basically adding in a skeleton for animation and posing. So I'll skip ahead and I'll let you know how long this took, and it shouldn't be shouldn't to be too long here. All right, and it looks like it did finish here. It looks like it only took about three minutes that second process. So this whole this whole kind of upload process with the auto rigging process, I guess in total took about five or six minutes. So really not too bad. And um, all, what you have here is just a preview of uh, the character looking around um, just to show you that the rigging is working properly. And you can kind of click and drag around here to see it from some other angles. And everything is about right. There is obviously some really weird stretching in certain areas when uh, you know the body turns too far. The, the metallic uh, armor isn't meant to turn that far. So it's, it's going to be wrong, but we'll keep that in mind when we end up using the, the poses and uh, just be careful about that. So all we have to do now is click Next, and it'll give you this uh, option if you've already selected a different character, and we definitely want to proceed with this new character. So let's click Next. And now we should finally see it in the actual scene here. And now we finally have the character ready to go and we can look through all these different poses and let's find one that's uh, close to kind of what we want here. All right, and the next step here is to kind of uh, search for actions that you might think you want or just kind of scroll down here and browse for different animations um, that catch your eye. So for my purposes, I'm looking for a very, very simple uh, kind of standing pose so that uh, these guys can look out over a balcony, maybe with an arm out holding a spear. But uh, it doesn't matter if the exact pose isn't quite right for what you're looking for, because uh, you can continue to edit the pose further once we uh, put this into Blender. So all I'm looking for is something that um, at some point during this cycle is going to be somewhat close to what I'm looking for. So what I'm thinking is um, in this sort of, uh, there's a few options. So let's let's search around. Um, so if you, if you just click in this search, you can actually um, type certain actions. Like let's say you want to do something with a sword. There might be a, a, a few options for a character animation using a sword. Um, so just to kind of show you what's going on here. And some of these have a lot of different animation cycles in one pack. So um, you might want to avoid those unless you're looking for a, you know, a real lot of options. So for example, you just click on this, that one's sheathing a sword, some of these are attacking. And uh, yeah, so let's, for our purposes, let's try and just search, maybe looking. There might, there might be something with that kind of a keyword, something like that. And um, we'll be able to try in Blender all the different keyframes along this cycle. So if we're happy just with just one, let's say just like that, then we can download that and, and just use that single frame for our shot. Um, in this case, he's, uh, this stance is a little bit passive for me. I would kind of like it if there was a little bit more action to it. And again, we can adjust it a little bit once we bring it into Photoshop, I mean, into uh, Blender, sorry. 
So yeah, I'd, I'd like the idea of something like that. And we're gonna download a few different options here so that we can, um, we can try them all out. So I think something like this, but not bending so far forward could be, could be cool. And then if we want, we can just use the basic stance as well. So let's click download on that. It'll take just a second. And you'll see that downloaded there and it'll, it'll be titled the name of the animation that you selected. Um, let's try finding something, some more basic walking cycle. Um, all I want is just to populate the, uh, the grounds of the palace with some, some palace guards walking around. So something like this will work perfectly. Let's download that as well. And let's try for one more here, just for some nice variety. Um, this one walking cycle will get us a lot because we can use different keyframes from this whole cycle. So that's, that's good for walking. Um, I wonder if there's one with a spear. I was kind of looking that up before. Uh, I, I'm kind of thinking these guards could just be standing at attention holding some kind of a spear or flag or something. Um, and I kind of like some of these actions here. Even though it's talking out water cooler, <laughs> it's uh, not exactly era appropriate, but I think it could be, some of these could be interesting for some guards in the foreground. Maybe they're talking. I kind of like that. He could be leaning over to talk to another guard. So let's use that. All right, so we have three options here. Telling a secret, <laughs> walking, and looking. So the next step is just to import these in the Blender, and you'll see they'll uh, come in with the animation cycle, and I'll talk about how to use that. All right, so let's import these characters into Blender and get some cool poses out of them. So first things first, I'll hit A and delete everything by default. And I'll go to File, Import, and choose FBX because that's what comes out of Mixamo. And go over to your downloads and you should see all those options here. And let's just start with the walking uh, animation cycle. So I'll import that. Take a second to calculate here. And there we have it. So you can see um, here's our character with the um, armature in there, but we have to do a little bit of upkeep to make it look correct. So first of all, I would recommend selecting that armature that's kind of sticking out there. And if you click this little object data properties on that armature menu, and then unfurl viewport display, let's change that to B bone option. I just think it looks a little bit better, easier to work with. And then check on in front so that you can see the skeleton through the geometry there. And uh, basically, now you can kind of see if you uh, push this up a bit so you can sort of see the animation keyframes in there. If you just scroll this uh, bar along, you'll see we do have the walking cycle in here in Blender. And then by the time it gets a little bit later, it's completely done. So um, we're going to duplicate this guy and choose a couple of different walking poses so that we have some variety for our scene. So let's right click this armature and select hierarchy so that we've selected everything in there. And then we'll hit Shift D just to duplicate it and move it over here. So now we have another armature and both of these guys should be hooked up to the walking cycle now. Um, so before we go any further, let's do another thing. And every single one of these objects right now is, um, they're all completely separate, um, just like we, the way we you know, sculpted them in 3D code. And it'll be a lot easier if we just merge them together for now, we'll still be able to separate them if we need to. So let's do that. Select all the meshes in here. Hit Control J. There we go. All right, so we have all that mesh and it's still all completely hooked up. Perfect. So let's do the same for this guy over here. So we'll uh, skip, unfurl his art, whole collection here. And then we'll skip over some of these um, first few options and just select the first mesh. That's the orange object. Then we'll scroll down to the bottom of the collection, hold shift and select all the actual meshes in there. And now if we hit control J, should group all that together into one single object. Um, and if we play here by in the, my hacky is shift spacebar for this, we should see everything's still hooked up to the walking cycle. All right, so 
we want to uh, choose a couple of different poses here and freeze them. So let's scroll along here. Let's try one with kind of an, a leg forward like that. So we'll do that to this one. So what we need to do is select the object that we just grouped together. And uh, first of all, let's double check. So if we hit Alt P, we should clear the parent to the armature and keep transformation. Okay, so it won't be parent to the armature anymore. But we also need to apply the modifier on there. So we'll select the object, go over to modifiers, and you'll see this armature modifier. And I'll just hit Control A while hovering over it to apply it. And now we should be able to move that around without any deformation. It's no longer linked to this armature. And also when I play the uh, walking cycle, you'll see it's completely frozen. So we can actually just select that armature and delete it for good. And let's choose, a, let's scroll this bar a little bit and choose a slightly different pose for this character. Maybe one from a side view, they're slightly different. One leg's kind of back like that. It feels nice. And we'll just do the same process. We will select the object here. We'll hit Alt P to clear the parent, keep the transformation, and then apply the modifier by hitting Control A. And then lastly, we can actually just delete this armature once again. So now we have two objects here. And um, if we were to tab into this character, we'll see it's very, very high res. We haven't decimated it from 3D code at all. Um, but also, every, even though we merged everything, everything's still separated by, by mesh, right? So if I hover over just this object and hit L, we'll see that is its own object. And the same goes for all these different pieces here. So we'll still be able to apply different textures the way we want it. All right, so let's just uh, name this first character, maybe walking one. And then we'll rename the second one walking two. And now that we have a couple different walking options, let's import a new pose. So file, import, FBX. Let's go with, um, the looking option for now, we'll import that FBX. And it'll take a second to calculate and it'll place right at the world origin. So we need to move these other characters over a bit to make space. All right, so if we scrub through this, we'll see that's the only one, that's the only character that uh, is currently uh, hooked up to some kind of animation. And uh, even though I'm pretty happy with some of these poses within this cycle, I just wanna show you how to change the pose if you wanted. So first of all, let's select the armature and do the same process. We'll change it over to B-Bone, check on in front. And if you have the armature selected, and let's say you scroll along here and you're happy with one of these poses, except for something small. So you're, you're happy with the general feel, but you just want, wanted his arm out, for example. All you would have to do is select the armature, switch over here to pose mode, which should now be an option if you have the armature set up like this. And now you can um, click on one of these little um, skeleton pieces here and rotate them or scale them or move them just like you would any other object in Blender. But generally speaking, when you're working with skeletons, you just wanna rotate things, of course. So by hitting the R key, I can just move his arm out, maybe select this segment of his bones, maybe this joint, and you can see from uh, certain angles, if you change your angle anyways, you can kind of change the pose into whatever you want. So very, very useful. And uh, you know, if you wanted a specialty pose, keep in mind for this character, we kind of grouped up all of his fingers into one mitten. So these uh, pieces here, this kind of one skeleton piece for all these fingers here. But if we did have you know five different fingers per hand, it would have a correct bone structure for each. Um, so, you know, we, we don't need to worry about that for this level of detail, but keep that in mind. So let's say you would finish repositioning him and you're happy with the new pose. Uh, don't, don't hit tab to go into edit mode, by the way, while you're in pose mode, that might uh, lose your posing progress. So when you're finished, you actually want to click over here and click on object mode, and that'll switch you back to here. And then another thing is when you're finished posing, don't scrub or play the timeline at all because then it'll jump back to the keyframes already assigned. So if we're happy with that pose and we want to freeze it in place forever, we need to go through the exact same process with the other one, as we did with the other ones. So I'll right click, select hierarchy, and uh, let's, um, let's 
uh, actually unfurl and select all the meshes here by hand. Hold shift. And let's hit control J to join them as one mesh. It'll be a lot simpler to apply all the modifiers. Next, we click on that single object and hit Alt P, clear, and clear the parent and keep transformation. And then finally, we have to delete or apply, sorry, the modifier right here. And now nothing should happen when we uh, scrub through the timeline, except you can see the original bones moving there. So we can actually just select that and delete it. So there we go. Now we have three separate poses. And um, I'm pretty happy with most of them, but I want to make one more really quick. And I just want that one to be standing at attention. So I'll just speed through the process here. File, import, FBX, looking. Mm -hmm. It should appear here on the world origin. And I'm actually just going to pretty much go with the standard standing pose here. Let's, uh, let's put his arm out, though, so he could be holding a spear or something. So B-bone in front. And I'll just select his uh, armature, go into pose mode, and just kind of rotate the arm out here a little bit. Maybe something like that. So it could be holding a spear. And then we'd also need to adjust the hand a little bit. Not too worried about the exact placement of the hand because we won't be seeing all that from our shot. But just so that you're aware of how this could work, this is kind of how I'll reposition things. Maybe his arm would be a little bit lower. All right, something like that. I could see that working pretty well. So let's say we were happy with that. Again, all we need to do. So let's click on here and switch back to object mode. So I have all those meshes selected. Control J to group them up. Let's make sure we're selected on the right things here. There we go, they all grouped up correctly. Alt P will make sure we're cleared from the parent and finally apply the modifier. There we go. And uh, I can now select the armature and delete it without changing the character. All right, there you have it. I think that might be pretty much all the poses we need. Maybe I'll make a couple more, but I'll be using the exact same process here. And then uh, we'll be able to texture just one of these characters and then link its materials to all these other alternate poses. And we'll have a whole collection of characters. All right, next we're going to try applying some textures to this character. So um, I've actually gone ahead and downloaded some materials from Quixel Bridge. Uh, this is what I'll be using to get uh, some metallic material, the leather for the straps, and finally, some cloth for the shirt and uh, pants material. If you don't know how Quixel Bridge or any kind of uh, anything about materials in Blender, I recommend going back to the other section where uh, I've kind of gone over some of that. It's the Fantasy Palace um, environment, and then also in the section where I kind of give an overview about materials in Blender could be useful as well. So for now, I've downloaded a few of them, and uh, we'll be hooking them up manually from Blender because my uh, plugin from Quixel Bridge is currently broken. So I'll go over how to do that as well. So uh, each individual piece here did export from 3D Coat the way we wanted it, all completely separated. So we should be able to kind of um, do one piece of material for each section and then link that up to everything that would uh, have the same material. So let's give that a shot. So let's select a piece here that uh, should be metal, and uh, we'll create a new material. Call that um, armor. And over here, we should have the basic node set up. I'll select that and hit Control Shift T. And uh, here's our library of uh, mega scans that we've downloaded. So if we look here, there's a couple of imperf surface imperfections that I've downloaded. And that's what all I'll be using for the metallic maps. So I'll open up this one, and all I need is this roughness JPEG. And I'll click Principal Texture Setup, and that should apply on here. Let's change the base color to a slightly darker tone for the metal. And then to get the um, roughness map kind of worked out, let's switch this over to Generated from UV. And then uh, let's next add a color ramp node between these two and crunch that a little bit so that we can kind of see what we're working with here and should start to see some 
of that uh, roughness imperfections there. Uh, let's up the metallic of this material quite a bit. And then lastly, we can adjust the scale of this roughness map by clicking and dragging over all these and uh, dragging back and forth to, to get some different small or large scales. So let's just pick something like that that we're relatively happy with. And now that we kind of have that set up, we just need to select uh, all the pieces in here that uh, we want that to copy that material from. So let's select a couple here just to kind of show you what I mean. Just pieces that I think uh, should be that same metal. And uh, let's select this one last and then control L and uh, link materials should work there. So we're gonna go over this whole character and do, uh, do that for every single piece that should be metal. And I'll skip ahead and continue when that's ready to go. All right, and uh, we've pretty much gotten everything I think that should be metal. There's a few that will later change over to a gold trim, but for now, let's just stick with the metal. Uh, next, let's do this leather material. So let's select one of these straps here that uh, we want to create a leather material for. We'll create a new slot, new material, and rename it leather. And uh, we should have this basic node set up. Once again, I'll click on it and hit Control Shift T and go back a step into uh, the mega scans that I've downloaded. And I can see this fabric leather option that I just downloaded from surfaces. And in this case, we'll try and grab all of the available maps. So all three of these and click principal texture setup. And uh, let's do a little bit of upkeep here. So in order to get it to read correctly on these meshes, let's switch it from UV to generated. And then let's switch all of these maps over from flat to box mapping, just for simplicity's sake. All right, and I've sped up the video here uh, and I'll just be walking you through the next few steps here real quick. Um, so basically I will just add in a really simple uh, fabric texture there. We can add in a RGB curves to uh, adjust the base color just a little bit to kind of um, match what we had going in 3D coat. And then we'll just use uh, link materials to kind of uh, follow up all these different objects. We'll also be creating a uh, kind of a quick skin texture here with just a really simple um, sort of noise in the uh, normal map. And then we'll be adding a little bit of subsurface to that base shader. Really nothing too fancy on that. Uh, I'll be adding in a uh, sun here just to kind of check how all this is looking in a uh, rendered view. And finally, we'll be adding in a gold texture here. For the gold, um, we're not going to be using a texture map. Just like the armor, we'll be only using a roughness map and a color ramp to kind of uh, punch out those scratches just a little bit more. And we'll update the mapping of that uh, roughness map just a little bit so that we can start to see the effects there on the gold material, and of course, up the metallic as well. Moving on, um, we'll uh, need to know a little bit about uh, how separated meshes work. And um, if you uh, have watched the other sections, you'll know just the L and P hotkey there to select different areas. One note about going into edit mode while you have uh, meshes parented to a skeleton like this, and you saw it there with the helmet, but uh, when you go into edit mode, the uh, mesh sort of jumps back to its starting position away from the skeleton pose. So uh, you just need to be aware that that's happening if you're going into edit mode to you know, grab different sections and apply different uh, material slots. Uh, yeah, it will jump away from the skeleton. You'll make those updates. And then when you tap back into object mode, that mesh will jump back to the skeleton once again. And we'll be using a little bit more of the RGB curves uh, here, just to kind of affect the base color of that leather material. Um, and then of course, adjusting the mapping just a little bit to kind of get a general sense for the scale of the texture on there. Um, the uh, mapping we'll be using just uh, generated for now. Again, we could have gone with a uh, neat little bit of UV unwrapping, but uh, it's just not necessary for something like this where we're just kind of trying to get a really simple generated texture over uh, a 
a lot of different areas at once. And now that we've kind of finished uh, with all the texture, we're uh, going to duplicate that character and do the same process that we talked about before, where uh, we'll freeze one character and then scrub through the animation and try out some different poses using that same set of keyframes. Uh, and then we can go ahead and freeze that into the armature as well. And next, we'll try and generate a different type of pose. Uh, we could use that same armature and hand pose it using the pose uh, method, but it'll be so much simpler if we just import a preset animation from Mixamo and then uh, transfer all our materials over. And then we can still tweak the pose if we want, but at least we'll have kind of a base to work with. So since this is a completely new mesh, we will have to be retexturing, but a lot of the work is already done for us because uh, we've already textured those other characters. So the easiest you know, kind of method here is uh, rather than separating out different meshes, we'll just make different slots. And uh, once we link all the materials over from a character that we've already textured, um, each piece of this new character will have all those different slots on there. Uh, as, as long as we've grouped that uh, together as one object. So now if we just go through and assign different slots to different pieces, we should quite quickly be able to retexture this to match the other characters. And when we're done with that, we could just apply the armature to uh, just freeze that and start thinking about importing a new pose. Of course, we'll move it over from the world origin so that when we place a new character, it doesn't overlap. And with this new pose, uh, we will just uh, do the exact same process of linking over materials. Um, I sort of had, at this stage, worked out a little bit of a faster way to do it now, uh, where uh, since I merged all those objects together into one, one piece with Control J, um, linking uh, those materials over will now add all those different slots to all these different pieces. So it does sort of speed up the process for me a little bit here because I'm able to just uh, assign the correct material slot. But you know, again, it's nothing too fancy. It's nothing that we haven't talked about before. It's just um, kind of working with the uh, quickest method here to get all these materials linked up correctly. And we're happy with that pose. So uh, we'll just duplicate it. And uh, we'll apply the armature and uh, clear the parent to that uh, first pose just to save our progress. Now, uh, the same animation could actually be used uh, for the standing pose holding the spear. I just sort of scrubbed back to the beginning of the animation, and uh, the character went back to a standing position. And now we can hand pose the arm out holding for holding a spear uh, just by going into pose mode and making those edits. And then finally, we'll apply that armature and clear the parent as well. So now we only have this one last walking character who still has an animation. Uh, we have enough walking poses already, so we don't really need it, and we'll delete it. Now we'll just sort of check everything that we've done in rendered view, and everything's looking good. We're pretty much done with these guard characters, so we'll move on to the king. All right, so the process for the king character was almost identical to the palace guards. Uh, the only main thing here at the beginning is that I did import a slightly more detailed uh, character rather than using 3D Coats um, default human. And mostly I just wanted a little bit more detail in the face there um, in case we wanted to do some close-ups of our King character a little bit later. Uh, but ultimately it's, it's almost the exact same process once you switch it over to surface and then uh, place that character. So you can see here we're using the same box layer method to add in a quick shirt. We'll smooth out some features there and then do the same for some quick pants. And now from here, we should be able to uh, quickly sculpt some kind of uh, variations on clothing. Um, you know, we'll be adding a little bit more in terms of folds and clothing details than we did for the, uh, for the guards. And that's because the king isn't wearing all this armor kind of covering that up. Uh, I found some reference of these kind of fancy uh, pants with these uh, kind of flutes in the thighs there. So we'll try and hint at that by sculpting on it a little bit, and then uh, we'll adjust it a little bit later. Fast forwarding right along here. I know we're going a bit fast, but uh, all of this is exactly the same methods that uh, we're, we've used before. Uh, I'll try adding in a little bit of a cuff and um, 
you know, I, I didn't bother Vox uh, extruding that. I just ended up sort of using the pose tool to kind of push it out a bit. And uh, I will try and um, pose out this collar a little bit with a little bit of a flare. Um, you know, from a design standpoint, I was just thinking that the king, you know, you know his costume could have sort of some fancy uh, collar element to sort of show his, uh, you know, his affluence. So I'll try making a nice selection shape that I like there. And I couldn't end up doing it with the um, in, in box mode. So I did end up switching over to surface mode there. And I'll try uh, using a box layer in this case to make a nice clean uh, extr extrusion. And um, you know that has two benefits to switch over to surface mode there. One is that we can go ahead and use the box layer. And then also, you know, we'll avoid getting some odd uh, voxel effects if we start st stretching that color. So I'll move on to try and adding in some fancy buttons here. And um, the method I'll use is just go ahead and drop in a new primitive object. And now I'll use a uh, instance or the instance tool to uh, duplicate those up. And each this way, each object, um, you know, each button object will be an instance of each other. So once we kind of place them here, which is a little bit tedious because I have to manually go in and readjust them. Uh, but once that's done, they should all be linked up together uh, using the instance tool so that when we do make updates to one, it'll update to all of them. So we'll try just cutting some little button holes here and should update on all of them. And in a second here, I'll try merging them all together. Uh, but I don't want to be destructive because that will you know, lose the ability to edit them individually. So I'll just drag that one off there to the left and um, keep that as a separate button layer just in case you want to make updates later. Um, it doesn't end up mattering actually, but uh, you know, try to save elements that I uh, might want you know, to not be destructive just in case as I work. So we'll make some slight adjustments to the button there. And then finally, we're going to add in a little bit of extra trim and hopefully some fancy elements to the costuming here. Uh, we'll just uh, made a mistake there with this voxel object and accidentally cut some holes into the uh, collar as I uh, added that frill. So we'll just fill that in with the fill tool. Uh, the fill tool generally works quite well with voxels just to uh, you know cover up those small mistakes. Uh, but it does tend to be sort of uh, weak, so you uh, usually have to up the strength quite a bit in order for it to uh, work the way you intend. And I'll just separate out these uh, upper part of the pants here in order to have a little bit more control, adding in some extra thrills and details on here. Um, I was looking at some, again, some reference for these kind of fancy uh, medieval era pants and just thought some extra kind of trim there would help sell the character. Uh, we forgot to add shoes onto this character, so we'll quickly throw some boots on there. And because this was the more detailed uh, model that I downloaded from uh, the internet rather than the default 3D code character, we actually had those uh, toes there. So we'll just use the fill tool there to sort of fill all the space in between them. And hopefully that'll give us some sort of a uh, boot shape. And we'll add on a similar type of trim just by uh, box layering out from that boot and then adding in a nice seam as well using the box hide once again. And then uh, we'll just follow the same sort of trim pattern as we did on the uh, other areas just by uh, using the move tool and a little bit of radial symmetry there to push up some of these uh, half circle shapes uh, at the top of the boots. So now we're finally ready to uh, add in a little bit of a crown here. We'll just box layer out from the uh, the you know shape of the head, and we'll we will try a little bit more radial symmetry here for some kind of interesting effects on the crown. Um, not worried too much at this stage about the details. Again, this is going to be somewhat far from camera, but uh, we just want to kind of think through at least from you know how it might read from especially from the back, just to have some kind of a crown shape on there. Um, using or maybe overusing the move tool a little bit just to sort of push those spikes in the crown upwards, but uh, it gets the job done. And really just kind of adding in the finishing touches here to some extra, you know, trim on the cuffs and the shirt. Um, 
you know, nothing, nothing fancy again, just sort of sculpting out a little bit from elements that we've already established and adding in that last level of, of final detail. Um, I'm also going to try and um, you know, hint at some stitching along the boots and the pants here using, again, a similar process, just a box hide one half, and then we'll use base clay with a simple brush just to sort of uh, dab some you know, stitches on the side there. Um, I noticed there's a little bit of a hole here in the underside of the arm, so we'll just quickly fix that with a little bit of the grow tool and uh, the fill tool sort of working together there. And uh, hopefully that'll add in a little bit more believability to the feeling of cloth uh, draping over the body as well, uh, just because then it'll hang a little bit further down from the uh, base mesh of the body. Uh, we'll try adding another couple seams here in the shirt, just one more level of detail. And again, all of this is somewhat sourced from uh, some decent reference that we found online. All right, so now we're going to try out something that we haven't talked about too much before, and that is a little bit of a cloth simulation in 3D Coat. Um, this is very, very simple to use, and um, basically you can see me trying it out here on a cape. Uh, but all it is is you make sure you're on a box layer, and uh, you go over to the cloth tool and just click uh, default to um, grab some sort of a simple kind of plane or box shape. And then you just sort of place it uh, just above where you want it to start draping from. So in this case, the shoulders. And then you just click Start Sim. And it'll start falling with uh, some kind of a gravity there. And it'll sort of uh, start to feel like clothing. And uh, you can hit Enter at the end to sort of place the object that it's simulated. Uh, we're not going to go too much in depth with the cloth simulation. Uh, we'll work with it a little bit more when we get to the queen character, just because we need it for the uh, dress. Um, but for this, this cape uh, for the king, we don't actually end up using it in the final painting. Um, and that's mostly because the, uh, the cape tends to, this type of drapery doesn't tend to import very well into Mixama. Um, so, you know, if one way to get around that would be to just hide the drapery and uh, export everything else and import that into Mixamo, uh, and then later add or, you know, reintroduce the cape in Blender to the character. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the uh, queen a little bit more. For now, we're just going to wrap up the king here, check everything in render view, and uh, move on. Next, we'll just go ahead and start texturing that king character. So move everything away from the world origin, just so that there's no weird overlap, and um, import the uh, whole king character right in here. So I did uh, add in a simple Mixamo animation. I just found one that kind of had his arms outward. And uh, in the back of my mind, I knew that we were eventually going to want to place this king in our scene kind of uh, looking out over the balcony railing. So that's why I kind of went with a pose that sort of matched uh, what I wanted. And then of course, in, uh, you know, in pose mode, we'll slightly adjust the pose as well um, and get something even closer. So uh, we're just somewhat happy with that pose. So we'll start thinking about adding in some type of materials here. So um, first things first, we'll switch over to material view and that always takes a second. And then uh, we'll open up Quixel Bridge and just do a little bit of hunting for a couple extra materials. Found this one called Old Decorative Wallpaper. And uh, I thought that might uh, be an interesting pattern for his uh, shirt. You know, uh, generally speaking, just wanted it to feel a lot fancier than the material that we had on the uh, guard characters. So we'll just do the same process here as we've done a few times now before. Uh, where we download the assets and principal texture set up onto a uh, new material that we've you know, specified just for the king. And I'll tab into edit mode here just so that I can uh, you know, hit uh, L and hover over the meshes I want to assign that to. And then once again, I'll just assign that to each mesh uh, as we go. And just the final bits of texturing here, we'll import the uh, extra maps that we're missing and just sort of hook up everything. And we'll slide the uh, scale around as, you know, as needed, 
just sort of find a uh, pattern size that somewhat feels appropriate to the scale. Uh, we will create, uh, or we actually had already created the skin material for the guards, but it'll be even more important for the king because uh, we, uh, you know, have so much more of his face showing. Um, so we'll uh, need to adjust that in a minute. For now, let's use some of the materials that we've already created for the boots and uh, similar, similarly for the crown, just use the same gold that we've already established. And in a second here, we'll need to check everything that we've just done in our final rendered view. You know, it's all very well and good, sort of looking at things in material view, but in render view sort of reveals a lot. And you'll see now the uh, subsurface uh, setting on the skin material was way too high uh, once we saw it with the lighting. So we'll just lower that a bit and uh, you can also adjust the subsurface color there on the uh, main skin shader um, and that'll give some nice uh, you know, skin effects as well. So I just realized that I had sort of a doubled up mesh there on the pants. Just uh, delete that. Again, that's a holdover from 3D coat, just accidentally doubling things up. And uh, finally here, we'll just sort of uh, reassign some different colors to the lower part of the pants. We're trying some things out. I'm not sure yet if I want them to be the green version of the fabric uh, or the blue version. Um, you know, it was feeling a bit too multicolored with the green and I couldn't quite decide. All right, and we're ready to start our third and final character here uh, with the queen. And uh, I've actually imported a model that I downloaded again, just. Uh, you know, to have a little bit more detail in the face in case you wanted to do some other shots of the king and queen later on. Uh, so to start off, we'll do, you know, almost exactly the same process as the other characters, just uh, sort of sl uh, slowly build out the clothes from the base mesh of the body and uh, pay close attention to the thicknesses. Uh, in this case, it'll make even more uh, importance how thick the clothes will be because uh, we know we're going to want to add in some sort of a dress, and we don't want these elements to sort of fight with the mesh of the dress. So we'll just sort of adjust the neckline a little bit there, and now we'll get into uh, sort of the next slightly more complicated stage, and that is again just the cloth tool. So let's talk about this for a second. So we've made a new mesh, and we switched it over to voxel mode. And then we've gone over to the cloth tool and that brings up this tool options. And you just want to place the, the uh, default cloth there just above wherever you want the cloth to hang. So in this case, I've hidden the shirt and just having it hang over the bottom part of the body. Um, and that way we can hopefully, you know, get a convincing transition from the shirt to the bottom part of the dress. So you can actually adjust the cloth simulation as it's sort of falling just a little bit with those extra tools. And you can see I was adjusting it there. Um, so you, you can mess around with the cloth tool and get some interesting results. Um, the thing with this uh, type of cloth simulation though is that it generally doesn't work if you switch it over to voxel mode just because there's so many extra little details needed to get those folds. So I would always keep something like this in surface mode and uh, everything should work correctly. So now we're trying to integrate that cloth simulation with the upper part of the dress. And I'm gonna try a couple things here. I end up just uh, sort of re remaking the, you know, the shirt uh, or the top part of the dress there. And uh, hopefully it's gonna transition nicely into the bottom part of the dress if we just keep the materials the same. Uh, and I will try and just extrude out a little bit of a belt to sort of hide the seam between the two uh, sections of the dress, and that seems to work pretty well. Uh, first though, I noticed a few little holes here that happened, I think, when we moved the shirt away from the body. So again, we'll just sort of fix that by switching it over to voxel mode and using the grow and fill tools uh, just to kind of uh, fi fix that area. So here's the belt, and um, you know we'll just extrude that from the regular part of the body, and then use the uh, move tool just to push it out a little bit to accommodate the extra folds of the dress. And next, we'll just think a little bit about some kind of uh, jewelry or necklace here at the neckline. Um, I'll try making a uh, sort of necklace shaped selection here by um, making a large selection over the whole face and then holding control again with the 
oval uh, selection tool and that'll deselect a, a, another part of it. And we'll just uh, extrude out a little bit of a layer there. And we'll try coloring that gold once again, just to sort of hint at some kind of wealth and affluence with the king and queen characters. So next we'll try adding on um, some sort of almost like blouse detail uh, over the dress here. And um, in the end, I think it does end up just becoming kind of another piece of the dress itself, but I think it does help with breaking up the design of the dress uh, with a couple extra vertical lines here. And uh, right here, uh, it's hanging a little bit and that's because I tried using the cutoff tool in combination with uh, a layer that's on surface and quite high res. So uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, I think I did briefly, but uh, the cutoff tool, it does, there is a version of it that works with surface objects, but it seems to work mostly with voxel objects. So just make sure if you're going to be using box height or cutoff, you know, just switch that layer back over to voxel first. And here I'll actually experiment a little bit with switching the dress itself or the bottom part of the dress over to voxel. And uh, I tried up it and it just wasn't, wasn't working very well. So I ended up keeping it on surface mode and we'll use the pose tool there to just extend it all the way down to the ground. I think it looks a little bit more elegant. And we'll try just using a smooth tool to sort of smooth out the transition there just a little bit. Uh, so it doesn't, you can't tell where the uh, transition is. Next, we'll uh, try adding on a little bit extra detail to this necklace piece. Um, I was experimenting with a sort of pose selection there, but it wasn't getting a clean selection because the mesh was too low res. So we'll end up just uh, using box hide once again to make some quick cuts and uh, work from there. Now we're uh, ready to start adding on some stitching and a little bit of uh, extra detail to the sleeves and uh, other areas of the dress itself. Similar method as we used on the other characters. We'll just box hide a piece of it where we want the seam. And then in the second, we can start adding on uh, some actual stitching elements very, very simply again, just with a little bit of sculpting. First, we'll just extrude a, a little bit of a cuff element there. And again, just make sure, making sure that the thickness is you know, thicker than the value that we gave the rest of the dress so that it pops out in front. So here, just the base clay tool again to uh, kind of dab in some little uh, stitches there. And we'll sort of try and follow the, um, the seams that we already established just to give it a little bit more, you know, some kind of extra detail along there. And we'll try adding a little bit of uh, design here to the belt. Um, you know, we mentioned that we weren't going to get too detailed with any of these characters, but it just seemed like a, uh, an element that just could really use a little bit extra uh, something. Of course, in the end, this character doesn't end up uh, that close to camera, so you can't really see that detail, but just help me at this stage kind of get a feel for the world. So now we'll uh, try adding on a crown just to kind of match the king. And we'll try adjusting the initial box layer selection here to get some interesting details. Uh, all of course with symmetry on the x-axis. We'll experiment with uh, sort of in, uh, slightly unusual crown shape. Um, I don't know, I had some uh, leaf skeleton reference I was trying to mix on my other monitor in, uh, in along with you know crown regular crown designs um, in the end it might not it might have been too just a little bit too out there so I'll end up just cutting that off and sticking with a simpler crown design and lastly we'll just kind of add on other extra necklace element again in the back of my mind kind of thinking that that might uh, go along with the sort of doubled up language that we had in the uh, palace section. So adding on a couple extra elements here, hopefully, uh, especially rings and golden rings that are sort of stacked on top of each other, hopefully will uh, call back to the designs in our other sections, at least a little bit. So we're coming up on the end of the 3D code part of the character process. And in the last section, we'll just sort of finish up the texturing and uh, model some weapons for the palace guards.
All right, so here we are in Blender, and uh, I've just kind of skipped over the texturing process for the queen. It's absolutely nothing new. It's everything that we already saw with the king and the palace guard characters. And I'm just going to model uh, some quick weapons for the palace guards right here in Blender just to keep things simple. Uh, so I'm going to be using a method um, for modeling, and it's uh, primarily using the subdivision surface modifier. And uh, if you're not familiar with this type of modeling process, it is quite common. And um, the, the gist of it is that you sort of block things out in a very blocky sort of straight uh, 90 degree angle manner, just like this. And uh, what you end up doing is, uh, first I'll delete half of the mesh so uh, that I can add on a mirror modifier and that'll just keep things simple so that uh, we only have to work with one side. Then we'll add on a subdivision surface modifier and that'll just kind of smooth everything out um, and if you want to adjust how uh, sort of sharp the curves are, you can add in just another edge loop. And uh, very often you'll have two or maybe sometimes three edge loops um, sort of controlling the curve of a side with the subdivision modifier. So that's just a very quick method to block in something like this. And uh, we'll throw on a, the metallic texture that we've already created. And uh, rather than modeling an extra element of the uh, sheath, I decided to just assign a leather texture to certain areas to sort of hint at that. Uh, accidentally deleted some vertices there. That's why you saw that breaking, uh, but we'll just control Z that back and just generally place these swords uh, somewhere that would make sense in relation to the sword belt. Um, I will try and model one last little detail here with a Bezier curve. And uh, we went over curves a little bit in the other section with the palace, but basically you can just um, extrude out some depth to them and assign a material. And they uh, are a very good method for doing something like this, where you just want a uh, hanging piece of rope or string uh, or something like that. So we'll just try and connect these vertices uh, close to the sword belt, at least so that it's somewhat believable and uh, have it sort of hanging off the side there. And uh, finally, we'll add in a cylinder right here and uh, just sort of hint at a connecting piece so that it would be somewhat believable that the, uh, the sword belt would connect there. Next, we'll throw in a gold texture for that and just bevel the edge just a tiny bit uh, just in case you wanted to do any close-ups of the, uh, you know, have no super sharp hard edges anywhere. So next we'll just duplicate that sword and try and hook it up somewhere that would make some sense on each character. Um, I was tried to join all the meshes there, but I realized I was working with some geometry and some curves, so that didn't work too well. So I'll end up just kind of keeping them all as three separate elements here, the sword, a little uh, loop for the sword and the connecting piece. And I'll try uh, Alt-D to uh, keep these meshes as instances in case you want to uh, make changes that will update on them all. And as a last step here, we'll uh, try and quickly model something that uh, could work for the spear character. Uh, basically, just throw in a cylinder and uh, apply a wood texture to it. And lastly, I'll try and block out the spearhead. Uh, again, a little bit of a subdivision surface modifier method. So we'll just make it very blocky and straight, throw on the subdivision surface modifier and see what comes out. And then we can sort of slide the edge loops around and uh, you know, adjust the shape a little bit there. Uh, I tried to kind of hint at a leaf shape just to go with our overall design language uh, on the blade there. And lastly, we'll just extrude out an extra kind of connecting piece between the blade and the, the rest of the staff. And uh, I'll try and hint at some kind of a uh, string or rope holding this on by duplicating some extra edge loops and uh, turn, trying to turn them into curves and then uh, adding depth to those curves. Couldn't figure out why they were uh, not working and I just had to lower the depth on them so that the uh, string wasn't so large. Finally, I'll uh, throw that into a collection and generally place it where uh, it would make sense with this character's hand. And uh, I kind of saw that it needed to be a little bit longer to look kind of more cool. So I just 
extended the base there. And we're pretty much done with the character stage. So just check everything in rendered view. Thanks for sticking with me throughout this whole process. And uh, this, these characters were a lot of fun to put together. I know everything was very uh, fast and quick with this method uh, from 3D Coat to Mixamo to Blender, but uh, hopefully it'll get us the kind of quick characters that we need for our concept design.